we're going to look at the Lord Jesus Christ, because he said if he be lifted up, he'll draw men unto him. And as we lift him up, we glorify him, and we are built up in the Lord Jesus. So we're going to look at him today as the only begotten son, the only begotten son of God. Our foundational text is found in Gospel of John, first chapter, in verse 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelled among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. We see where the Lord Jesus Christ is the only begotten son of God, but he was the first begotten son of Mary. See, Mary had other children. Jesus is the only begotten son. Jesus is and was and always will be the only begotten son of God. In the sense of nobody will ever experience that kind of birth he had. It was a birth conceived through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the womb of a woman, a virgin. Man didn't have anything to do with it. The only begotten son of God, full of grace and truth, full of grace and truth. And verse 16, and of his fullness have all we received. Now, if Jesus Christ is full of grace and truth, and he says of his fullness, all we have received. You have privileges to his grace and his truth. Be strong in the grace that's in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall know the truth, and the truth act upon will make you free. Not just knowing about it, you got to act upon it to be made free. And so all of this comes out of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it also presented to us by him. In other words, he presents it to you, but he can't make you receive it. And when you do receive it, you receive it through the power of the Holy Spirit by faith. And you act accordingly. you got to act on the word of God. Even the simplest little thing. Then he goes in verse 18. He says, no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. The Lord Jesus Christ is very, very God. And he came down from his throne of glory to express the father to us. He came in the likeness of a human being so that we could see him as an example as how to live the life of power from receiving from the Father. The life we live is a life of power. It's not just a regular life. It is a life of power because it comes from its source, God. Our life in us, the Lord Jesus Christ, is from God himself. So the source The Lord wants everything in your life, whether it's spiritual or physical. He doesn't separate them. He does not separate the physical life from the spiritual life. We might do that. Well, at church and then, well, I'm at home. Well, that's at church. But he doesn't separate it. He see it all as one. And at the basis of it is the reality of redemption, what Jesus Christ did for us. So you can't separate no part of you from the Lord. All of you goes to him. So it says Jesus Christ declared him. Or he decreed him or he came and made himself visible to us so we could see how it is to be a God in a flesh bone body. Now, if the word of God doesn't have any effect on the way you live or the way you talk or the way you thinking, you're missing it somewhere. The power of God present changed the way you think, changed the way you feel about people, changed the way you take in consideration somebody else. So then the Lord will lay the responsibility on you as to how you react to somebody else. He won't hold that person responsible. He'll hold you responsible. Let's go to John 3.16. The only begotten son of God. And he will always be the only begotten son of God. It says, for God so loved the world. Well, the reason why he loved the world was we was a part of the world. He so loved us, his family that was a part of the world through the fall. Over there in Romans, where it says sin entered the world through Adam, and through sin came death, and everybody was guilty before God. He so loved us. Now, that's a love. You can't stand God. Don't want to have nothing to do with him. Messing up the way you live your life, and he's still loving you to deliver you from out that mess. Now, that's love. That's a love that don't want to hurt nobody regardless of what the situation is. It's a self-sacrificing love. I'll take the blame. If it's going to make you feel good, because God can trust me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to judge it. 
He didn't do that. But that the world through him might be saved. So when we get ready to judge things, but you should rightly judge things according to the word of God. And you should take in consideration the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't take nothing else in consideration. You take in consideration the Lord Jesus Christ, how he would and what he did. So in reading the Bible, you are reading to with the intent to do what the word says, not just to have the knowledge. You feeding off of the word of God, your inner man feeding off the word of God. That word creates the virtues of Christ in you. It literally translates you, your spirit man, into Jesus. Only if you surrender yield to the working of it. Now, if you still want to be you, he give you that choice. You still can be you. I don't want to be me. I don't been me before. He that believe it on him is not judged and not condemned. Why? Because the law of the spirit of life is in operation. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made you free from the law of sin and death. This is in operation. As you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, also righteousness is being imputed to your account. Believing has to be anointed because believing is a work of God. God does not separate himself from any part or facet of our life. We are the ones that pull away. Once you realize that you've been called and separated unto him for his purpose, not for your own. And like I said, this is a work of a lifetime. It's just not a once and for all, dear, because Christ has come to you to get your attention and cause you to recognize you're going the wrong way or you need to turn around and look and take an account of. That's the only reason why. The Lord is determined to keep us on the track. He's determined. He will not be outdone. He is God. And he knows how to bring one in that he's called from the foundation of the world. He that believeth on him, verse 18, is not condemned, but he that believeth not is judged already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, believe in the name is not just believing in Jesus. It's believing in what he represents, his nature his character, the very fact that his whole essence is that of deity. And now the reason why I'm going through this is because the word of God tells us over there in 1 John, the third chapter, beloved, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called what? Sons of God. Omnipotence, omnipresent, omniscient. Whatever the Holy Spirit sees and knows Concerning the mysteries of the kingdom. You ought not be interested in anything else. Don't nothing else carry weight. Not with God. So what that should make you start doing is being more God conscious instead of self conscious. Why do you think you was baptized in the Holy Ghost? So that the Father could be all in all. He gave you that gift to complete him. And complete you in him. See it's all about the Father and his who? Family. It's all about the household of God. Other than that. If you're outside in the streets and you ain't in the house, that's the choice you make. But when Jesus come back, now he already told you what he coming back for. He coming back for a church that's without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. And then he going to turn around and told you he going to work this in you. So what is our responsibility? Surrender and yield to the working, the one who effectually works in us. That's all we have to do. When you miss it, I missed it. Forgive me. First John 1 and 9, and start right back. You ain't got the wall in, just start right back. Okay, let's go to First John 4th chapter. Let's start in verse 7, because it's a command. He's speaking to us. When he says, beloved, we are loved of the Father. He says, let us love one another. If you love one another, you let First Corinthians, the 13th chapter, operate in your life especially in your family and among your kinfolks. This is your training ground. You said, well, Lord, I got a family. I can work with it and you can teach me some things. He says, beloved, let us love one another. We done read 1 Corinthians 13 chapter, but read it don't mean nothing if you're not putting it into action. You actually got to bite your tongue before you come against God's word. You got to pluck yourself side the head before you think of something else that's against God's word. Why? You got lives in the balance. Lives. And it's amazing how you will pass people up because they don't fit your criteria. Now, I still remember what Brother John said. The Lord will send you by somebody 
and you kind of got an inkling you need to do something and then you don't, well, that's a soul that could be going to hell. All it took was one. Why is that? If you're God conscious, you will see and know what to do. But if you're conscious of you, you won't. You will condemn or judge or, well, they that way because that's the way they want to be. Ain't nobody the way they are because that's what they want to be. You know, we said make the choice. But then if you are not in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, and I do mean being in love with him, you can't rightly make the choice because he's not indwelling you. You know what Paul says, when I want to do good, evil is always present. And that what I want to do, I can't do. This takes a determination of the will. It takes an absolute, irrevocable determination of the will not to turn back. That means you burn every bridge behind you and don't care who try to rebuild it, as long as you ain't. Because when Jesus come back, that door go close. If you unrighteous still, Jesus Christ is nitpicky. <laughs> he is. How you going to keep this law and then break another one? Huh? He don't want none of you with you. He want all of us out of ourselves gone. He wants you to step out of yourself and leave it behind and let him fill you up with him. And this is in everyday practical living. I ain't talking about getting in the pulpit preaching and all that. I'm talking about living your life that way, period, wherever you are. Amen? Yeah. 1 John 4 and 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. You using his name? You say you're a Christian? Well, what about that self-sacrificial love that only God has placed in your heart by the Holy Ghost? Huh? For love is of God, as to his nature. And everyone that love it habitually, I mean your life, your life is a habit of love. Every act that you do flows out of the God kind of love. Every word that you say, you say it because it's of God. Now, you saying something and the love of God came back. And why would you say it? For love is of God and everyone that love it is born of God and know it God. It's because you've experienced his love. You've experienced yourself yielding to the love of God and he using it to be a blessing to somebody else. Because it's more blessed to give than to receive. Mm -hmm, It is. He that love it not. Now listen to what it said. Now we talking about 1 Corinthians 13 chapter. We talking about you dying to yourself, dying to the world, dying to flesh. He says, he that love it not. We talking about that self-sacrificial love that takes others into account. He said, no, it not God. I didn't say that. This says that. You haven't come to know him. It says love covers a multitude of sin. Ain't that what the word say? Well, if I love you, I don't see no sin. I should be looking at the blood of Jesus. Oh, I done been there. And why do I want to go back? There is nothing that the word of God has not left out. For God is love. As to his nature, he is love. As to our nature, we are love. Verse 9. In this was manifested the love of God towards us. What did John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This is how the Lord manifested his love for us by allowing his son to die on Calvary's cross in our behalf. He loved us when we was dead in trespasses and sin. Well, how come you can't love me like that? You see where I'm coming from now? Jesus Christ was the example. So then there's also a scripture verse that says that if I pray for you, I can give you life as long as you ain't committing no sin against the Holy Spirit. How you think you pray for your brothers and sisters and God give them life? You requested it. Look in 1 John 5 and 16. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death. If any man see his brother sin a sin, go talk about it. Go over there and say, child, did you see what they doing? He didn't say go talk about it, did it? If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask. And he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for. All unrighteousness is sin. And there is a sin not unto death. Every wrong action is sin. Do you hear me? Every act that's not of faith is what? Sin. Faith working by what? Love. So everything go back to the God kind of love. And that's the first thing you ask. Man, am I allowing God's love to manifest itself in me? At what cost? 
The first thing the Lord tell you to do something, uh, you proceed to do something, the first thing you go think about is how is this going to affect me? How is this going to make me look? What is it I got to sacrifice? You be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ and his word. If you're faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ, a lot of things you do, you will not do because you're faithful to him. You're feeding his life in you and that life itself is creating Jesus' virtues in you and will cause you not to do certain things. Four and nine. In this was manifested the love of God towards us because that God sent his only begotten son in the world. For what reason? That we might live through him. Jesus Christ is to be the source of life, physical life and spiritual life, mental life, everything. Anything apart from Jesus Christ, it will not work. It just won't work. You'll think it's working, but I say it's setting you up for a great fall. It looks like it's working fine and everything doing good. And before you know it, that rug been pulled out from under. And you'll know it wasn't God because God added, what did he do, Jackie? Give it to you, make it rich, and add no, no sorrow. You don't add no sorrow to it. The sorrow of this world works what? So you let people make you all sorry and have sorrow. I ain't talking about sorry, but have sorrow of heart. That's working there. Jesus can't work in that. So people that cause you to have sorrow of heart, what you do to them, Sister Ruth? You got to leave them alone. You pray for them, and I'm going to tell you one thing. You can let your friends actually move out from you because... As you look at that person, but you, you look in your own heart to see whether you still got some of that stuff in there. You don't look at them to judge them, but you look at them as kind of like a measuring stick. Do I still have that in me? Uh, conversations and everything. You got to judge it. We're going in the rapture. I keep saying that. We're going in the rapture. And Lord, whatever it takes to get us straight, to be holy and blameless before you, let it drop. Why? Because you know your life is protected. Now, that's how serious this is. Now, when he said in this was manifested the love of God towards us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world, our Lord is the uniquely begotten son of God in the sense that he actually came forth by eternal generations. Well, what you mean, Sister Lee, eternal generation? In the beginning was what? The word. So he was already here. So actually he came down in the form of the word and the word was made flesh. But it was a birth that never took place because it always was. Because he's always been here. Come with me to John 8 chapter. He's a uniquely begotten son of God in the sense that he proceeds by eternal generation from God the Father as God the Son in a birth that never took place because it always was. Why? He possessed co-eternally with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. That's essential deity. He always was. John 8, 56. He says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, you ain't 50 years old yet. How you don't see Abraham? Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. See, he's always, he's always. Okay, I'll give you another one. Let's go to John 17. Look at verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with you when? Before the world was. So he came forth by eternal generations. We are through procreation. That's man and woman, procreation. Jesus Christ came through the womb. He came the same way we came, but it was the word that was made flesh. We came through with the union. So that's procreation. That's how we come. In the same chapter, look in verse 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me. See, you don't belong to you. You shouldn't want to belong to you. The God of the universe, the only cattle, a thousand here, all, all the seven gold. Why you want to belong to you? Whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. Which thou hast given me, for thou loved me before when the foundation of the world. Revelations 1 and 8. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, said the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. 
So see, he proceeded forth from eternal generation. And he was born from the womb of a virgin, but he pre-existed before this happened. He just took on another form. He came from outside into the human race. He was born from outside into the human race. We were within the human race already and born within it. So men never will be begotten or born in the same sense as Jesus was. So we never would be born that way. Now, our sonship is on a different basis. And that's of what? What is our sonship based on? Spirit of adoption. Well, you receive Jesus Christ as your savior. But then the father has to adopt you in order for you to have the inheritance. You got to be a son. I can go and adopt somebody right now. That means they got everything Jack and Jojo got. They're entitled to everything. If I got bills and debt, they'll be entitled to that. See, son, spirit of adoption. Romans 8 chapter. Let's start at verse 14. It tells us if we live after the flesh, you go die. What it means? It means that the life of Christ in you gets less and less and less. Whenever the life of Christ in you is not growing, something else is going to cause you to turn away from. It has to be growing in you. You're either going to stay where you are or you're going to turn away from him more and more. You don't even know you don't turn. So this is an everyday fellowship. This is not a hit and a miss. This is every day. You don't miss a day reading, studying, and praying, talking to him. You can talk to him anytime you want to, all through the day. Just tell him, Lord, I just want to take time out and tell you how much I love you with all of my heart, my mind, my soul, my strength. You know, I just want to thank you for being my shepherd. Just love him. This is daddy. This is father God. This is where the spirit of adoption takes place to make him our father. This is where our father comes from. This is an intimacy as a child with his father. Not a servant or slave mentality, but a father and a child. God loves his children. He's just trying to get us to return that love to him. How? How we handle other people. Because they might be the only Jesus you'll see. So whenever you work in the flesh, you're working corruption. You just want flesh to be just, Lord, I don't want this flesh. I don't want to live like this. But you got to want that. It's only through the Holy Spirit that you can make dead anything. If you say, I'm not going to do this no more, you ain't solve nothing. Ain't no power behind that. It'll be the same old, same old. It takes the Spirit of God to break the power of whatever it is you don't need to be doing anymore. Well, Sister Lee, I'm not really having anything. Out. Well, that's good if you ain't got nothing you don't need to be doing anymore. I got a whole bunch of stuff I don't need to be doing. And I'm by myself. Who I'm with. Look at verse 14, it's a promise. He said, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God. Oh, that's going to say the whole lot. They are the sons of God. See, when you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, I like to call him a believing sinner. It's a sinner that, still a sinner, but because they heard Shambach at his meeting, they believe in Jesus Christ. What God does is take that believer and Make him, put him into the body of Christ, but he's just born again. In other words, he's still a sinner, but he don't have no knowledge. But he done been taken out of one state and been put into another state. Okay. Then God, guess what? Calls things that be not as though they were. He places them in there as an adult son. No more minority. Because if you are minor, you don't have no inheritance. You got to be put under somebody till you get up. So he takes us and puts us in as an adult son so that we can inherit what he has for. If you could only believe that everything that Jesus got is yours, you have inherited everything that Jesus possessed is yours. Oh, well, he owns the world. So do you. But you got to live this way. This can't be on your mouth. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. The spirit of bondage has to do with your disposition and attitude. And they do have some things that you are afraid of. That faith ain't working. Your faith won't work. They got some things you don't realize. Yeah, you got some things you're scared. You still got a bondage of fear in you. Because you're not letting faith have its perfect work. Only faith can take that stuff out. What the world endeavors to do is make you a slave to fear. If you're watching TV, all the commercials are geared up to what? Geared up to the world to cause you to fear. Whenever they're talking about a cold, 
They got the fear. They just build everything around to just get you scared. Your leg might be hurting, and this might be this. You need to take this, and your mind wants to work. I wonder, is it that? That's fear. That's trying to bring you back into slavery, to fear again. Romans said, but you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby you cry, Abba, Father. You ain't made a son, he can't be your father. Well, I received Jesus as my Savior. I thought that made me a son. Yeah, but what you going to do with that sonship? You got to understand, go down here a little bit further. Well, we're really a little bit further. Verse 16 is a promise. The Spirit himself bears witness or testimony to my born-again, recreated human spirit. That what? I'm a child of God. The Holy Ghost bears witness with my spirit. My spirit is being energized by the Holy Spirit, and that makes me conscious of God. And whenever I have a conversation... It's always about God. God is in there somewhere. He's always in there. Now, you may want to listen or you may not want to listen, but that's the way I'm built. Then it says, and since you are a child of God, listen to this now. If you are a child of God, then you're an heir. Now, the Holy Spirit bearing witness to this, you conscious of it. You're not only an heir, but you're an heir of God, a joint heir with Christ. Oh, now we got the identifying marks of being an heir. What are they? What are the identifying marks of airship? Providing that we suffer together with him. You don't suffer together with Christ, you won't have the inheritance. That we may also be glorified together. We all going in a rapture. Look, I always ask the Lord, let the church suffer while it's young. So when we get older, we'll have sense and won't have to go through, <laughs> won't have to go through that stuff. We've been got it when we was young and didn't know no better. He could work with us better. But if you don't suffer together with Christ, that means whatever come against you, Sister Candace, it's not you. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. I don't care who it is. The enemy uses people to push people up against you. Human church activist, pastor gave him that name. So then all you got to do is recognize who behind it and smile and say, I see that. It come for the possessions that God gave me. Now, if you enter into contention with them, what possession? They're being erased. He done got your goat. No, the things that God give you are precious. This is where the issues of life are. This is what you keep. You don't let nobody steal that from you. Nobody. Don't care what it is. Anybody try to bring you outside of the household of God, I'm not going out there. Tell Jesus his mama and his brother and them want him. They're a lunatic anyway. And what did Jesus say? Looked around. Who is my mother and my brother and my sister? But those that do the will of God. Okay, let's go to Ephesians 1 and 5. So again, I can explain this to you. I wrote it down. It says, God takes a sinner who believes in Jesus, regenerates him, and by means of this, it makes him his child. He's born again. Then he takes this child and places him in a legal position as an adult son under grace. See, when you're a child of God, you're still under the elements of this world. You don't know nothing. But then God quickens the dead and call the things that be not as though they were. He sees you as an adult son with all the possibilities of heirship and being a ruler to reign in this life. He becomes a joint heir with Christ as an adult son in which he becomes an heir of God, inheriting jointly with Christ all that Christ possesses as an heir of God, the father, by virtue of his sonship and his work on Calvary's cross. That was why you were predestinated. The other reason why you were predestinated was to conform to the image of Christ. And so I said, well, Lord, what kind of message do I give him? God already told you what he's going to do. He's going to do great exploits. He's going to have everything on display so people can know that there still is a God. But the only people he's going to work with are his. How else are they going to know that there's a God? He ain't got many. Huh? He got to manifest himself through us for people to know. That's why he separated you unto the gospel. You belong to him. We just got to get our program straight and our criteria and what we need to do. It's just simple. He just wants us to conform to the image of Christ. Ephesians 1 and 4. According as he has chosen us, that's God, in him, that's divine election, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy, talking about character, and with that blame before him, where? In love. You go find everything in the God kind of love. This is what you endeavor to do in the God kind of love. 
Because it covers a multitude of sins. It will not see your wrongdoing. It will not even talk about it. If it see it's so wrong, it'll pray for it. Having predestinated us, or foreordained us unto the adoption of children. That's so we can conform to the image of Christ. He did this by Jesus Christ. He did this when Jesus Christ was incarnated and he went from the cross to the throne. But he predestinated us to himself and it was according to the good pleasure of his will. All things work together for good to those who are the called according to his purpose. See, you were begotten by the will of God, begotten by the word of truth. The truth was the agency which God used you to beget you to himself. Only the truth can make you free. That's only the truth. The truth about what? What she said and he said and what they said. No, the gospel. That's the only thing. Other than that, everything else is a lie. If God don't put his signature on it and your spirit don't bear witness to it, then it come out the word. Turn my head the other way. Because you know what it's designed for. Come to get you. You ain't going to be God. No, you go hold fast to the things of God. Romans 8. We want to be conformed to his image, conformable to his death. This is what God is determined to do. He going to do what he said he going to do. You can underline everything in the Bible. He said he going to do his great exploits. He got to use somebody to do it through. And you want to be the one because you're conforming to his image. Romans 8, 8 and 28. I just finished quoting it. Now, see, that's the reason why whenever we pray in tongues, the Holy Spirit takes hold and he actually is praying the will of God for the saints. Everything is built around for the saints, praying the will of God for the saints. He's not praying that this happened in somebody's house and that. If he can get the people heart straight, the right thing will take place. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Oh, I just love the Lord. Uh huh. Now he separates it. He says to them who are the called according to his purpose. You don't love him when you want to love him and then all of a sudden you digress and become another way. This is a love that works 24-7. You just can't love him one minute and the next minute you be mad and huffy puffy. The joy of the Lord is my strength all day long. For whom he did foreknow, God is fixed and unchangeable. And there's a divine election. If he knew you, and he did, he foreordained you and he predestinated you, to be what? Conformed to the image of his son. Whom he predestinated, he called. Whom he called, he justified. And those that he justified, he glorified. And so all of this is going to take place. He wrote it, it's going to take place. So then you focus on what the words say. You don't focus on what the other people are saying. You focus on what the words say. And when you talk to people, bring them the word. You can bring them the word without even saying Jesus' name. Amen.